My name is Tyler Pekka. I work with KEB America. I'm an application engineer. I'm one of the guys that you'll speak to if you need uh, any tech support or if you're having some, some issues with your, your elevator drive. Um, today we're going to go over a bunch of different things. We're going to start out with the most basic uh, overview of a VFD and then uh, dive a little bit deeper, talk about how to start one up. We actually have uh, some demos in front of you. We'll go through how to do some hardware diode checks. We'll look at uh, the internal workings of the drives themselves. And then uh, we actually have a few demo units up here that will uh, we'll have a few volunteers come up and see if they can start them up and make the motors turn. Um, from there, we'll move into some more advanced uh, ride quality tuning. And then uh, we'll move on to our, our regen drives and talk about our inverter programming software, Comnibus. In front of you, you will have a, a copy of the presentation here. Um, if you want to follow along, that's great. They are yours to keep. So feel free to take notes, um, doodle whatever you need to do on them. That's fine. Um, I also have included a few quick start guides uh, for both versions of our keypad as well. Those are yours to keep, too. Uh, to start things out, do we have any questions right away? What we're going to cover, uh, we'll take a few breaks, um, kind of stand up, stretch out a little bit. I know uh, eight hours of class time can be a lot. So don't worry, we'll take a few breaks. And um, yeah, if you have any questions going throughout this, if you want to please just raise your hand. Uh, I'll repeat the question for the, for the camera here so we can uh, have a good video. But um, yeah, feel free, please ask questions. I'm going to ask for some engagement. That helps with the discussion here. Uh, that's where the real learning happens. So feel free to speak up. And with that, we will begin the presentation. So we're going to go and start out with just a, a general topology overview of the, uh, of the drive. Uh, this is not exclusive to, to KEB. This is how most, most drives operate. Every drive is going to have three main, main parts. You're going to have your, your input uh, rectifier. That's going to take your input, a, or your uh, AC voltage, turn it into DC voltage. You'll have your intermediate circuit. That's going to contain a DC bus and a braking transistor along with a charging circuit. And then you're going to have the actual inverter output. Uh, these, this is going to contain the IGBTs. Um, this is what's going to actually take that DC bus voltage. It's going to pulse on and off very quickly, simulate an AC sine wave <coughs> out to the motor. Throughout the presentation, we're going to feature our H housing drive. Um, the internal workings of the drives are going to be very similar. Uh, they will vary slightly from housing size to housing size. What you have in front of you right now is going to be a G housing. Um, so for the most part, everything is going to look very, very similar, uh, but just laid out to a little different in internal to the drive. All right, so the input rectifier. If you were to take the, the keypad and everything off of the drives in front of you uh, and actually look at the, the power stage board itself, this is what the input rectifier is going to look like here. Um, you've got one for each phase here. And again, this is what's going to take your, your AC um, sine uh, voltage, turn it into a DC voltage. All right, moving on to the intermediate circuit. We're going to have the, the um, charging circuit up here in the corner. Um, this is used uh, on initial power up. So due to how a, a capacitor behaves or how a discharged capacitor behaves, if you were to initially power up and you did not have this charging circuit, um, there's going to be a large inrush of current. Uh, this large inrush of current is going to be uh, too large that it would actually cause damage to internal components of the drive. So to limit that, that inrush is what we do is we run the current through this resistor. And then as soon as the DC bus charges up, uh, we actually bypass that resistor and then we are connected directly to the line. As far as the DC bus goes, uh, that's going to have your bank of capacitors here. And again, um, the bank of capacitors, it's going to look slightly different depending upon your housing size. Um, but for the most part, um, they're going to be pretty easily identifiable by the, the black caps there. 
uh, one, one note that we say, um, if you're kind of wondering, you know, where should my, my DC bus be sitting? Um, am I at the correct level? Uh, the easy way to figure that out is to measure your AC uh, voltage phase to phase on the incoming and then multiply that by 1.41. That should give you a, an approximate value of where your DC bus is sitting at. A couple of other notes on the DC bus. The uh, DC bus will smooth out some line fluctuations. Uh, however, if the line fluctuations, whether it be a sag or a spike, if they are severe enough, uh, that will be reflected in the, in the bus as well. All right, continuing on with uh, the intermediate circuit, uh, we actually feature our braking circuit internal to the drive. The braking circuit is going to contain the braking transistor. That's what's going to turn on and off uh, when your DC bus uh, rises to a certain level. Um, I know some drives uh, may be in different applications, but they actually feature the transistor on the, the outside of the, of the drive. Ours is on the inside, um, helps create a more compact footprint. And again, if you're using a, a braking resistor to dissipate your excess uh, DC bus voltage, this is what's going to turn on and off to dump that extra DC uh, bus voltage across that resistor. If you're using a regen, this is not going to be active. Moving on to the output of the drive, um, this is where the IGBTs are. Uh, in this example, you can see we have three separate modules, one for each phase. Uh, the ones that you actually have in front of you is going to be on one single module. So again, that's just a variation of what some of the hardware components uh, look like. But um, in this case, they are three separate modules. Now, the IGBTs, what they're going to do, they're going to pulse uh, on and off very, very quickly. Um, that, that quick pulsing sometimes is referred to as PWM, pulse width modulation. Um, that's going to use a, a carrier frequency or a switching frequency. Um, that is different than the frequency that goes out to the motor. Um, so if you're looking, doing some troubleshooting and diagnostics, and you're looking and you see that, okay, I'm outputting 30 hertz to the motor, that is different than the carrier frequency. Uh, this example here is showing what an output out to the motor would look like. So as you can see, as you increase your frequency, you start to kind of smush your sine wave together. You decrease it. You stretch that out. Another thing to note on this picture here is the uh, length of the pulses. Depending upon what your frequency uh, is going to be out, output to the motor, those IGBTs are going to either switch on or off for a longer period of time to, to mimic that sine wave. So if it's pulsing on for a longer uh, amount of time, uh, you're going to have a higher or, or a larger magnitude of voltage compared to then if it pulses uh, in a slower amount of time. As far as the carrier frequency goes, um, we're talking about uh, the, the kilohertz range. Um, so those, those transistors are switching on and off very, very quickly. Uh, our default is going to be 8 kilohertz. Uh, we do have the capability to go up to 16 kilohertz uh, and all the way down to, to 2 kilohertz. 8 kilohertz and 16 kilohertz is going to be very, very quiet. You're not going to hear it. Uh, anything lower than that, you're probably going to start to hear a little bit of chatter for and especially at, at, at 2 kilohertz. Um, the faster that the, the transistors are, are switching on and off, um, it's going to have quieter operation, but it's also going to generate more heat. Um, so if you're in the situation where the, the heat sink is starting to, to get hot, and um, the drive says it is too hot, is what it'll do is automatically lower that carrier frequency uh, to switch at a, a slower level uh, to, to save on, uh, on heating issues there. Any questions on pulse width modulation? How it works? Yes? Well, my question about the carrier frequency, does a different carrier frequency value lengthen or shorten the life of the IGBT? So the question was, does the uh, carrier frequency, does a, a value actually um, increase or decrease the, the lifespan of the IGBT? And uh, I will say it, it depends, yes. Um, if you have a higher um, carrier frequency, 
you're more than likely going to be generating more heat on the on the um, heat sink and the, on the actual transistors themselves. And heat with, with any electronic components is, is going to be your enemy. So the more heating that you have, yes, you're going to decrease the... Uh, that's why we, we do say, you know, 8 kilohertz, that's kind of our... Um, our that is our default. Um, we do have the capability to go up to 16, but um, depending upon housing, how you have your drive size with your motor, uh, you could see some reduced lifespan with the 16 kilohertz switching frequency. So if you kind of want to dissect the, the power stage board here, um, this is what uh, uh, all the, the incoming power and um, the, uh, the low voltage power is going to be distributed by, by this board here. Um, this is going to contain your, your temperature circuit, fan circuit, all of the IGBTs, current monitors, voltage monitors, um, a couple of other notes on this. It's also going to contain the power part ID. Uh, this is another board that uh, fits into the power stage. That contains all of the, the power ratings for that particular uh, drive. Again, it's going to be overload levels, overcurrent levels, that type of thing. Uh, that's going to vary, again, by, by size of your drive. So that, that little board contains the information specific for that power stage. OK, moving forward uh, to the, the control card. Um, this is the brains of the drive. Uh, this is where all the, the processing happens. Um, it also contains the input and output terminal strip, X2A. Um, so this is where you're going to be running all of your, your hardware inputs and outputs into. Uh, it also is where the keypad connects to up in the corner here. And then uh, it connects to the power stage via a, a ribbon cable that's run through this little plastic guard here. And then the encoder board also sits on top of the, the control card in, in this section here. All right, here's the encoder card. Um, in this example, we've got a, an NDAT card here. Uh, we've got many different types of, of feedback cards available. Uh, the most common what you're going to run to run into in the field is going to be your incremental TTL for the induction geared machines and then the NDAT for the permanent magnet gearless. Um, if you have an application that has something uh, a little different, say a UVW uh, or a um, sine cosine, we do have those cards available um, so we can make that make that work for your application. We have two uh, versions of the keypad. Uh, you may, may have seen both versions in, in the field. Um, we've got the, the older uh, version 1.72 uh, US lift uh, keypad. That's going to be the, the LED keypad as we refer to it as. That's got your red letter display with your LF, US, RU parameters. Um, and then we also have our, our newer style keypad. It's our LCD as we refer to it as. Um, that's going to have a, a much larger screen. We actually spell out the, the parameter names instead of just giving them a number. Uh, we have multiple diagnostic screens uh, on the home screen. Makes troubleshooting much easier. And then we also added a few um, LED status indicator lights as well as another um, serial port for, for diagnostics. So. Does anybody have any questions on the keypads right away? We're going to go through some keypad navigations with the uh, drives in front of you. But uh, as far as differences, real quick, does anybody have any questions? I, I know the, uh, one of the most common questions that I get is, can, where are my parameters stored? You know, I, I switched a drive out. Do, do I have to reprogram my drive? Well, the, the answer for that, uh, for both style of keypads, if you switch a drive out, as long as you retain the original keypad, that is where the parameters are stored. So you shouldn't have to, to reprogram anything. The only thing you will have to do is synchronize the, the keypad to the, the new drive. Um, that's going to be done in US4. Um, it's going to be called uh, load configuration. We'll go through how to, how to do that or, or where specifically that's located. Yes, David. Question adjusted for so the question was, if you update software in the controller, do you have to change anything in the, in the drive as far as software and programming? 
Um, I will say again, that depends upon the customer. Um, I know with some of the customers, a new software update on the controller might require uh, a new setting in the, in the drive or a new programming um, parameter that you have to set. It depends upon what, what the update includes in the controller. If they're changing inputs or outputs, something like that, then yes, you may have to change a parameter in the drive. But um, if it is strictly uh, limited to just their, their controller, um, and they're not, um, they're not changing any, any of the inputs, the outputs, uh, any protocols or anything like that, then no, you, you don't have to. So say the controller did do an update mm -hmm. with the software, and it does affect your drive. Can you disconnect your drive and do the software update, and then come back and put your drive back in, or is it just better to go ahead and store it? Can you store it on your car, pull your car out, then do your update, and then put this back on and say relearn? Uh, so the question, can you, pull, is it, can you pull the keypad off, do your software update, and then put the keypad back on? Is that? And then do a alarm from memory from your keypad. Yeah, you can. So as long as the uh, keypad and the drive have been synchronized, you can pull the keypad off, put it back on, and you don't have to do any synchronization procedure. Um, as far as doing any learns, are you referring to, like, say, a motor learn or an encoder learn? If nothing changed on the motor side, um, you shouldn't have to do those learns again. Um, that's, that's another another thing we'll kind of talk about in the in the setup. Um, but yeah, as far as you know, making making software changes on the controller, as long as they're not affecting anything on the drive, you, you shouldn't have to reprogram anything there. Any other questions on the, the keypad? Is the O scope available on this? Can you view the scope on here? Is that only on the laptop? So the question, is there a, a scope function available on the keypad? Uh, no, there's not. So you would have to, to download our, our scoping software, Comniviz, for that. Uh, to to kind of continue with the keypad um, discussion, the parameters are stored on the keypad. So if you replace a drive and you retain your original keypad, you can, um, you can just put the, the original keypad on the new drive, do your synchronization procedure, good to go. Uh, however, if you switch keypads, you will have to program um, for, for that specific job. So if you get a new keypad and you have a permanent magnet motor, you're going to have to do the, both the motor learn and the encoder learn, as well as setting up all your, your inputs and outputs, speed profile settings, uh, and that. So the LCD, the newer keypad, actually has uh, both read and write capabilities. So not only are the parameters stored on the keypad, but it actually has the ability to pull parameters from the drive itself. Um, so if you've got a, if you wish to replace keypads for whatever reason, and your drive is already programmed and it's working, all you need to do is put the new keypad on, you can do a read, you will write the parameters back down to the drive, and you should be good to go. So that, that is nice with the new keypad. We do have both read and write uh, capabilities. And for the majority of hearing, very close to reading the Yeah, so the question, if you've got a four-car bank and you program one car, everything's uh, up and running, can you take that keypad, put it on the other drive, download the parameters? Uh, yes, you can. The only caveat with that is if it's a permanent magnet motor, you're likely going to have different encoder positions. So you will have to do a corresponding uh, encoder learn. I would also recommend doing another motor learn. Even though it is similar, um, each motor is going to vary slightly uh, motor to motor. So I would always recommend doing a motor learn and an encoder learn for each individual motor itself. But as far as inputs, speed settings, that type of thing, that's going to remain the same from car to car. So. Okay. All right, so that completes our first section. Uh, just kind of an overview, again, uh, of a VFD. That's going to be common ac across all manufacturers uh, for the most part. So now we're going to move into some, some uh, keypad navigation. Um, we're going to start out with the older keypad. Um, the ones that you have in front of you right now are going to be the newer style. Um, so I'll, I'll just go over the, the old style real quick. But um, since you guys are most familiar with the, the newer style, we'll, we'll actually do some, some live um, um, hands-on stuff with that. So 
you want to just listen for this section? 